Hi, I'm Dick Bourgeois Doyle, and this is the Teaching and Learning Research Integrity Podcast, a production of Path to Integrity, a project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. This episode features an interview with Katharina Miller, the lead of the project's training work package. Katharina is a practicing lawyer in Germany and Spain and a founding partner in the Madrid-based firm 3C Compliance. She has served on the boards of a number of organizations aimed at promoting equality and integrity. She is passionate about training and corporate ethics. Well, thanks a lot to Katharina for engaging in this conversation. What you've been involved in with Path to Integrity is really probably the thing that holds the greatest potential to have an impact. So it's it's one of the features of the project that's really been inspiring to me. But I'm, I'm kind of curious how you arrived at your interest in teaching research integrity and research ethics. You as most of your colleagues know uh, well, uh, are a practicing lawyer. You uh, worked in Germany and Spain. And of course, that's not divorced from uh, an interest in ethics. But why did you take a particular interest in it yourself? Yeah, so uh, Dick, thank you very much for this question, because it makes also myself reflecting, how did I end up with this amazing project? And it all started that before working with Path to Integrity, my company, my law firm, Little Boutique, we, I would say, or I would call it, we were working on corporate compliance. And a big part of corporate compliance and ethics is the training. Because uh, here in Spain, we had um, a big change in the law in, in 2010 already, but in 2015, it changed again. And that's where the corporate compliance entered Spain. And that's where uh, our company started to work. And we wanted to focus really on uh, corporate compliance clients and ethics and realized that if we want to get clients and we were focusing on corporations, companies, SMEs and and listed companies, so all sorts of companies and of course also universities, then we would first have to explain what this is. What is corporate compliance and ethics? And that's how I entered um, the trainings with organization, any organization, so from the private and the public sector. And that's when in 2018, Julia, uh, our coordinator, reached out to me and asked me, listen, um, there's this fantastic proposal by European Commission on um, developing something on teaching and uh, learning research integrity. Would you be on board? So I had already knowledge, a really deep and good and profound knowledge on corporate compliance, but not so much on research compliance or research integrity. And as I'm a very open person and um, always eager to learn something new, I thought, oh, that could be very interesting. So it really, I think it it only took one minute (laughs) to think about if I wanted to be part with our company, part of uh, the consortium. And yeah, so it was a huge surprise when Julia uh, received the OK by European Commission at the end of 2018 and the whole journey adventure started. So corporate compliance, is that compliance, and forgive my ignorance on this, but is it the compliance with a specific piece of legislation that dictates the framework for corporate ethics, or is it compliance with something that a corporation itself would establish? Yeah, thank you for that question, because that gives me the opportunity to clarify. So indeed, it would be a mixture of hard law and soft law. So it would really be a mixture of uh, a company has to comply with legislation by uh, by a country, but it also has to uh, fulfill its own regulations that it establishes itself, and that would I would call soft law, which becomes hard law in the moment that a company commits to this soft law, like a code of conduct, for example. Absolutely. So it would be this mixture of hard law and soft law. Yeah, and so re- I, I also started to teach business ethics at that time at, a, at another a law university, the IE Law University based in Madrid. So it was really a fantastic combination of corporate compliance and my business ethics and then entering uh, research integrity, which I have to admit was very a very new field for myself. But it's not hard to see parallels because there are overriding if not uh, hard laws, the framework of the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity that different institutions are expected to implement in their own uh, circumstance and environment. So there would be parallels to the framework you are working with in in laws and 
I think we're lucky that you came on board with not only that kind of legal background and expertise, but also the expertise in training people who may not always be receptive <laughs> to the kind of training that is being promoted. So uh, maybe you could uh, explain a bit about uh, your experience with Path to Integrity and, and specifically, what was your work package assignment? Yeah, so, and thank you for the compliment. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, the knowledge on corporate compliance and ethics and made it easier for me to understand research integrity. You're absolutely right. It's very parallel, very, yeah. And I was I'm still astonished sometimes that the problems, the issues are, are always the same. It is, it's always the tone at the top. So it's always about leaders in a university or in, in a company. Or what made it sometimes a little bit more challenging for me was just switching words. So instead of tone at the top at the companies, they would understand what I mean with tone at the top. I would never be able to use this in university. So you would always have to adapt a little bit to their language, right? Not I don't mean the, the um, language like English or Spanish or German, but the, the language they use, which is quite different b- between the academic world and the corporate world. So um, my work package was a very practical within the consortium. So my, I, I, I am still work package lead of work package five, which was the, or still is the training center. So I was the responsible person for the fact that people would receive training with the material that my colleagues have been developing during these three years. I'm interested in your comment about tone at the top. My background was with a scientific institution, but not an academic one. And tone at the top was a terminology that we used often. But what was the alternative in the academic world? Is it because there's so much emphasis on academic freedom in the university community, they don't <laughs> consider tone at the top to be the driving force? Or what, what was the uh, nature of the issue there? No, 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 they, they would, uh, sorry, that, that that's a misunderstanding, obviously. I think they would have um, something similar to tone at the top, but they would not call it tone at the top. They would like a uh, call, call it leaders at the university, the leader at the university, but they would not Call, uh, use the expression tone at the top. It's interesting. Maybe that, that would be the case in English-speaking countries, but not so much here in Europe. So uh, in the German university, I would not be able to say in German, speak, uh, it's important to have your tone at the top. And the same in, in Spanish-speaking universities, but Spanish-speaking or Spanish companies and German companies would understand what I mean with tone at the top using this expression. I think they also understand the universities in Germany, in Spain, or in Europe, understand it's about leadership, but the the expressions are different, and I think for them it's very important uh, to use the different uh, terminology and not to to get this mixed with uh, the corporate sector. That was actually what I was trying to pursue, was the distinction between training and ethics in the corporate world and the academic world and what kind of cultural issues uh, arose or if they did at all and what kind of adaptations you had to make to your training style. Uh, Thank you for the question. Yeah, so it's very different. Uh, The two worlds are really very, very different. So the corporate world really has nothing to do with the academic world. Uh, So, and it, it was easier, I have to say, to be with uh, students. Now, okay, I have to say that we had uh, many different target groups. So it was quite a challenge for myself, but I think also for my colleagues to train high school students because we also were obliged to train high school students that were 16 until 20 years old. So that was a whole different world. And I think they were the most challenging ones because uh, I'm not a trained uh, teacher for high schools. And I fo- I'm, it's a long time ago that I went to school, so that was really uh, quite a tricky one. And there, the most challenging part was to be not to be too acad- academic. So we always received the, the feedback that it's okay, what we are doing, quite interesting, but it was too academic for them. And it gave me a very hard time to understand what they mean with too academic. Yeah, because you receive feedback and this feedback sometimes is not <laughs> very down to earth. So they don't describe what they mean what by too academic. So it, it was really on me to try to understand what they meant. And I think there the challenge was that we made them read, for example, the European Code of Conduct of Research Integrity and maybe 
at the age of 16, you're not used to read these kind of documents. But still, I mean, it has to be challenging because if you don't challenge people, they don't learn. So I think that in, in the end, it was a good feedback that we were too academic because that made them leave their comfort zone, obviously. So uh, I, I took it as a good feedback in the end. And in the academic world, I think it was easier for me to work with students, a bachelor and master's students. And it became more and more difficult with uh, the more um, educated or the, the further up <laughs> our participants were, like professors. I, I, I did not teach professors, uh, but I think that would be the, the most challenging one to train professors because they seem to think that they all already know, know it all. And especially me coming from not having an academic title and coming from the uh, private sector, I think that would have been a double, uh, double challenge. Yeah. So you were pushed outside your comfort zone as well. I did the whole time during the whole three and a half years. It was absolutely, you nail it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things we uh, heard from uh, the high school students and perhaps too academic was in a label that uh, was attached to this concept as well. And that is they were more attuned to the discussions and the training when it was aligned to social issues and issues writ large like climate change and social upheaval of various kinds, as opposed to seeing themselves as researchers and wanting to learn these rules to become a practicing researcher. So that was a, an enlightening, but is also, a, I, I thought, a kind of an inspiring message because one of the things that seemed to come through, and maybe you can talk to this, was the fact that as students learned more about the relevance of integrity in research and research ethics to quality research and quality information, the more they had uh, trust in science. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we were together, Dick, we were together in a project, in a hackathon, <laughs> where we uh, investigated a little bit uh, trust in science. And absolutely, we could observe and see that when the high school students started to learn research integrity and research ethics with us, they normally started thinking they did not know anything about it. But the more um, they got involved and the more they, they trusted also them in themselves and in their own knowledge, the better I think their solutions became. And, and we could observe this by the evaluations that we, we, we did with them. And that was really amazing. Yeah, an amazing outcome. Well, we're now heading into the uh, final throes of the Path to Integrity project. You've uh, done your training and your work package. Uh, where do you see things going from here? I, I understand they may be putting some of the train the trainer materials online, and hopefully there will be a, an echo in the future of people taking the training, even though the Path to Integrity project, definable project, is coming to an end. Absolutely. So we had um, amazing feedback and amazing participation for our train the trainer. So we were obliged by our grant agreement to reach 150 educators and high school uh, teachers. And in the end, we reached far more. I think we are now with 220. So this is really very, I'm, I'm super happy and very satisfied with this number. That means, as you just said and pointed out, there is a huge interest in our materials, which I think is fantastic. Uh, and because that shows us that the need is there. Now people realize that the need is definitely there. And um, maybe it's because, and you mentioned it before, it's because um, people, teachers, educators realize that the climate change challenges is uh, growing and also fake news. We realize now also during the pandemic that fake news are a huge issue and that this is somehow all connected to research integrity. And so we absolutely hope that people will continue using our material, maybe train the trainer material or use directly our learning cards and they are all available on our website in a very prominent place and it will be very easy to find um, these documents. And of course, we are still looking for further grants so we can still continue our further development, profounding our material and reaching out to other stakeholders. Before we conclude, uh, one of the features of your approach to the project that I wanted to discuss was uh, gender issues and how they enter intertwine 
with integrity and ethics. Uh, you volunteer and you've uh, led uh, many efforts on that issue internationally, independent of the Research Integrity Project. But I'm just uh, curious as to how you uh, see research integrity, research ethics, and the training of it through the gender issues lens. Yeah. Oh, Dick, this this is a, another challenging question <laughs> because it took me a hard time first to get it uh, to the question, what is the connection between research integrity and gender? Because whenever I spoke with people that were in the research integrity universe, and that are not so many people, at least in Europe, uh, they did not see this connection. For them, normally there was no connection at all, and it seemed to be very um, artificial for them to get the, the link there. And then imagine to get then additionally the training aspect <laughs> to these two components. However, from the very beginning on and in the grant agreement, we said that there will be a gender aspect only in the trainings, in the education, because we know it's scientifically proven that men tend to speak more and longer than women. So we wanted to be very much aware from the very beginning on that we, if we train mixed groups, that also women or other minorities will have the same possibility to participate and to explain thoughts or to, to bring in what, what they think. And uh, yeah, and that's what I, I could actually observe that as I just said before, it is scientifically proven and it's also reality that men tend to speak more and longer, not always straight to the point or to the question or to the topic. And women seem to be a little bit more timid or yeah hesitant to say something and th and then there's a whole whole universe behind the question or the connection between research integrity and gender and I think that would fill another 10 or 20 podcasts so I would leave it here then <laughs> yeah I guess it's probably challenging or Enough for our exercise to note the implications for the teaching of research integrity, which was, of course, the mandate of the Path to Integrity Project. Well, uh, thanks very much for this. And uh, thanks so much for taking part in the project. You really added a special dimension to the whole enterprise that I don't think could have been uh, achieved without you and you personally. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That makes me very, very happy. And I'm getting red. I hope you can see this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this has been an interview with lawyer and corporate trainer, Katharina Miller, for the Teaching and Learning Research Integrity podcast, a production of Path to Integrity, a project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. For other episodes in the series, information on the project, teaching tools, and more, check out www.pathtointegrity.eu.